Thank you everyone for joining us for the weekly Wednesday workshop. Today we're going to continue our conversation with Linda Coffey, our Ag Specialist from our Gulf, um, I'm sorry, I'm from the Gulf States Regional <laughs> Office and Linda is the Southeast and, and located in Arkansas and definitely wanted to um, engage with our guests today, all of our people that have joined us. We wanted to let you know that we will be taking questions as we're conversating. Uh, we enjoyed that on the last conversation. And so at this time, I'll let Linda introduce herself and I'll go second um, in letting our audience know who you are, how you got into agriculture, and then how did you end up at NCAT? All right. Thank you, Felicia. And thank you for inviting me to your Wednesday workshop. I really appreciate it. Um, I grew up in agriculture. I was born and raised on a family farm in Missouri. It's been in my family, I guess, 150 years now, just about. And we raised cattle and hogs and some horses and sheep. And so I grew up with all of that livestock background. I went to the University of Missouri to study animal science, and I got a master's in, in animal science at the University of Missouri. My husband and I have raised sheep. Yeah, so I worked in the sheep farm in college, and I kept my sheep flock till I went to college. I did an internship at the United States Sheep Experiment Station in Dubois, Idaho, when I was in college. So I really like sheep, <laughs> and we've raised sheep uh, since. 1986 when we moved to our farm in Kansas until the present day. Um, I started working for NCAT in 2000 and it was a lucky thing for me because my my instructor at, at the University of Missouri, Dr. Ron Morrow, um, was here working for NCAT when we moved to Arkansas for my husband's job. And so when my youngest went to kindergarten, I came to work for NCAT and I've really enjoyed it. It's a great deal of fun. So. Wow, so amazing. Oats and grazing is my like big area. And I also deal some with hogs. Having grown up on a hog farm and raised some hogs um, in the 20 odd years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing history. We appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much. Well, my name is Felicia Bell, and I'm from the Gulf States Regional Office located in Jackson, Mississippi, and I do farm as well and, and really enjoy it. I call it legacy farming because I inherited everything, and we're a diversified farm, so uh, everything is on the land. Um, only thing I changed over were the animals. Uh, for is the large ruminant. I had changed from uh, cattle being raised in that to small ruminant doing um, sheep and for a little while did goats, but my heart, just like Linda, that's why she and I are such close friends when it comes to sheep. <laughs> because um, I do love that. And, and as you were here today, we talk about heritage breed. Um, we do have um, one of our NCAT uh, uh, administrators on the call, and she does also uh, livestock and then work with that heritage breed. So we wanted to share that with you. And so we just appreciate everyone joining us today um, for the, the livestock talk basically what we're doing. And again, for others that just joined us, I wanted to let you know that we are taking questions. So please place them in the chat as we're talking and that burning question come up, please add it in the chat. And as we see fit, we could pull those questions and, and answer them as, as we can. So Linda, let's jump into it. We, on last week, we're talking about heritage breed slash livestock on the role that they play in the ecosystem of our farms. One of the things that we brought up was um, symbiotic relationship of how animals work with us and work with that and we, what really creates a microclimate. We mentioned that also. And we're gonna continue that talk. One of the questions um, that usually I get asked, Linda, is smaller animals. So a lot of times we're told, especially for commercial use, 
is that we're not always supposed to start with a small animal such as ducks and rabbits and chickens and so forth um, to move in a commercial farm manner. How do you feel about that? That would be the first question. Like, how do you feel about farmers starting with the smaller animals and then monetarily adding uh, the small ruminants when they have the, the financial means? That's a great question. The smaller animals bring efficiency, but in some cases, more dependence on purchased feed also, and more labor, in my opinion, especially when it comes to like the processing end of it, but also uh, just making sure that they're rotated well, like across the pasture. If you don't have a good system in place, and we know some, some farmers who do pastured poultry and they have a good system in place, but if you don't, it will wear you out with just providing water and feed and, and keeping them rotated. However, it's cheaper to get in. It's, um, they grow so fast, so cash flow is improved. I mean, there are a whole lot of advantages to the smaller livestock, like you said, and, and just the efficiency of meat production is better on the smaller animals. Um, the advantage I see with sheep and goats is you can grass feed. Like mm -hmm. I'm not dependent on the price of corn or of byproduct feeds so much because for most of the year, they can be on my pastures. Um, less labor, um, so easier handling, I think. So I don't know, what do, what do you think, Felicia? What have I left out? Well, I was going to add, I my farm regimen and management style is totally different because the only time I utilize feed for the smaller animals are when they're babies. I, I okay. mentioned it last week, is especially for chicks, you know, with chicks and turkeys and a lot of the poultry, we're talking about possibly a four to six week span of raising them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only time I'm utilizing um, the chicken okay. feed. Are yours free ranging then? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, I do have chicken tractors. I have tried that management. Um, we ended up getting up to four chicken tractors. Now we'll have to share with people in Mississippi. If you're familiar with the Joel Salatin model, when you're in the South, it's very, very hard for animals because of the way they're built. It's not a lot of headroom in there, which, which creates hot air. And because we're so hot, you just have to make it taller. So yes. more air circulation. And so um, just want to make sure I give that disclaimer because uh, th that model does work where Mr. Joel is. But when you get 100 plus heat, 100 plus heat index, it really, really is stress on the birds. And so you have to move to, and I'm not going to get into models because that's to your liking, how you would like to build your chicken tractor in the South. We chose to use a, a bin a curvature model and, and went from there. So I have used that, um, have used that with, I call it like a rabbit tractor. I've utilized that. Um, but, and, and this is years, not something I just did yesterday. And so, of course, I always tell people with farming, it's trial and error. I, I, you're, you could, like I, myself, yourself, we're born into farming, but we're in a new era, though. And so how we were raised is, is it, you keep the traditions of the way you want to farm, that methodology, but we're in 2020. So what's going to work for you and I on our farm in 2020? And so that's what I had to tweak. Um, so everything is free range. Um, we don't have rabbits anymore. I'm bringing them back into the fold. I'm looking into doing Angora because we do have the Gulf Coast native as you do, Linda, and I do sell wool. So I wanted to add something else. I was thinking about the Angora, but I have to make sure that I have um, air per se, not necessarily air condition, but I have to make sure they're okay because Angora, they need, they cannot get hot. They cannot get overheated. And so those types of things we have to tweak. But yes, Linda, to answer your question, everything on the farm is free range. Even I was going to move to even the rabbits having their own area as well on the yard, on just out, uh, letting them burrow, but letting them be rabbits, basically. <laughs> um, uh -huh. 
And so that, but that's the methodology that I was just raised upon. So I'm not saying that works for everyone now because it, it has to be one, you have to be secluded. So you can't always have neighbors doing free range type things um, because the animals know no fencing. They, you know, they, they're going to go where they want to go. And so, you know, it really depends on where you live and what you can do. Uh, city limit ordinances really uh, puts uh, some stipulation on what you can do and grow and raise. So be very careful if you live within the city limits. Uh, please check with your city um, on their ordinances for raising animals. But that's, yes, I'm free range. And, and, and of course, like we talked about the grass fed with the, the small uh, uh, ruminants and stuff. So. So, so, I, so I have two questions. Yes. One is, how do you protect your garden? And the second thing is, <laughs> what about predation? Do you have any issues with that? So first question, garden, I let them go within the garden. Now, why I do that, because they're eating pests. I, I do have ducks, okay. I do have chickens, um, and in August we'll have guineas. So I let them go within to take out the pests. Um, predation, we have livestock guardian dogs, and we have the Great Pyrenees dogs. I've, I've had that ever since we have farmed early to starting our farm business in early 2000. So, and yes, they, uh, keep everything away. We have had many, many uh, animals uh, where we are. We have bobcat, foxes, um, you know, opossum, raccoons, any, you know, most of everything that everybody else have. <laughs> um, some areas have other larger animals, but those are the things. And yes, um, our animals, we used to hunt bobcats, so I knew we had them there. Um, but they, you know, so over the years, our, our dogs have taken those out when they realized the sheep were there. So um, just, but again, Linda, I want to let just our guests know and our audience know this is not overnight now. Please, please don't think that I did this overnight, that Linda did this. Oh, this is years of farming, you know, trial and error. We had to learn from different things we have done. I call them life lessons. Linda and I talked about it last week. I don't always want to say they are mistakes because we learn to pivot whatever we do on our farm. And if it doesn't work out, you keep moving. Um, you don't wallow. You just keep going at it. And so uh, I just want to stress that, that this is nothing that, that happened overnight. This is years um, of this. And I wanted to ask Devonna to chime in because she's also a farmer and have done heritage breed. How do you feel about that as well? What What is your methodology? Are you free range or do you do the feed and, and so forth? Yeah. Hi, Felicia. Hi, Linda. It's so mm -hmm. great to see you all. Hi, Elizabeth. I haven't seen yes. you in eight years. <laughs> I know. You. Um, well, I'm really happy to be on the call with you all today. I am Devonna Bell. I am NCAT's Director of Sustainable Agriculture and Rural Communities. I was not fortunate enough to grow up in a farming family. I think I would have liked to have been part of that Mississippi Bell family and <laughs> had that amazing education from your grandpa that I've heard you talk about so much. Um, and so I have worked in supporting ag and farming uh, internationally and nationally for a good 20 plus years and had always dreamed of having my own farm um, and about six plus years ago I got my farm in Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains so it's southwest Virginia we've got some elevation so it's not as hot but it's it's been hot this last couple of weeks uh, in the 90s and we've raised uh, heritage breed pigs and I started slow. I, I, I listened to your talk last week and I thought, that's right. You know, it's good for people that are starting off to maybe dip it, dip their feet in just a little bit. So I started and actually even maybe it wasn't as slow as it should have been, but I started with six Tamworth hogs, pigs. And the Tamworth breed, they are considered to be the bacon pig, which, you know, uh, I think most of us love bacon. And um, that was certainly what I was going for. We started with six shoats, so six piglets. 
a girlfriend of mine runs the Happy Rooster Farm down the road, and she used to breed Tam Marths. So I got the shoats from her. They were very hardy, good sized pigs and piglets or shoats at that time. She had already um, had already gelded or castrated them, uh, the boys, and I put them out on pasture. But in my setting, actually, um, I don't have a whole, I have about 37 acres here. We're in the middle of the woods on the top of a small mountain, a uh, big hill, whatever way you want to look at it. And most of my land is in woods. So about 35 acres of property is in woods. Pigs naturally like to be in the woods. Uh, the challenge for the farmer is getting that electric wire through the woods and not having it get grounded out by branches and things falling on it but that is exactly what we did we put uh, just a small amount on the pasture and went deeper back into the woods and then would have to constantly check the lines to make sure because those pigs are smart smart they hear that tick ticking stop and then the one pushes the other to go test it to see oh is that <laughs> if I push it into the hot wire they don't scream and then psh, they're all under the wire and all around even though I have my garden fenced off as Linda was asking about how do you deal with chicken because we do have poultry as well and we raise turkeys for the holidays to sell and so keeping they're all free range Felicia just like yours but I keep them out of my garden because I find it that they're too destructive to my garden I can't I can't have them in there. Um, I would love to be able to have them in for pests. I feel like I need to like pick a couple that would be good and toss them in. And the guineas can fly, so they will go in and out, and they're not too bad on the garden, but the others are a little too destructive. So anyway, all that to say, we've got the garden fenced off, so when the pigs would get loose, thankfully they weren't in the garden, but I've got a lot of perimeter gardens that have um sunflowers and things like this they would just tear up you know root everything they could get their hands on and and that was um that was something for a new beginner to livestock that was something to contend with the size of these tamworth pigs they're the large breed and oh boy do they get large and they get large quick so that's the beauty of it uh they're on pasture and in the woods so they are able to forage however I didn't have enough forage here and I doubt that many people do. Well, I mean, maybe if they've got some great nut trees growing in their forests, but uh, I don't have enough. And so we were feeding them an organic feed, which was quite an investment, but uh, I wanted to do it organically that time. Uh, the next time, um, then I, I'll talk about the next round that I also fed organically and moving forward, I'm considering doing a non-GMO feed just for the cost price point. Mm -hmm. um, but we uh, we did feed them organically and they got very big very fast. And then we had some huge rain and flooding right around time to take them to harvest. And I would I didn't have a free feeder, which is something that I would very much recommend people do. Um, there's a story there that my girlfriend's pigs, because she kept part of her litter and uh, mine were not the same weight because I wasn't having a built free feeder that was filled with all the food that they wanted. So even though I was feeding quite a bit and I ended up feeding the same amount of grain as her, my pigs were smaller because I missed a growth window that I didn't even know was happening because I wasn't free feeding. So that was an important lesson to learn as a new farmer. And then, um, when I was out in the field on those rainy days, bringing them their feed buckets, and it was all slippery because, of course, it's they've cleared the pasture part. They still had all the woods, and um, they're pushing me down. And I remember thinking, I remember hearing about a pig farmer that got eaten by his pigs, and I'm not feeling comfortable right now that I am going to be safe. And so they were pushing me hard because they wanted the feed but I really thought I was gonna go down because it was so slippery. So I decided to move on to American guinea hogs. So the Tamworths are a heritage breed. They are delicious, they are fabulous, and they I felt like they were a little bit much for me. And so then 
the next time next year i decided to or and for years after that i decided to breed american guinea hogs um, sell the shoats and then sell the meat and then also keep the meat for home consumption and american guinea hogs are about half the size of a large breed so they take 18 months to grow out um, the challenge there for soft-hearted people like me is then you get a little bit more attached to them i find that hard and um, i did not have a problem at all uh, eating those mean pigs that were trying to push me down and eat me i thought that is fine i'm going to eat you so as soon as i can i'm getting you to the butcher but but the american guinea hogs they're really kind of sweet and that was hard on my heart and my girl's heart too i have two daughters um, but that we loved raising them they are a lard pig so they have a lot of fat but i love cooking with the lard and they're a great homestead pig um, they do graze they're good grazers but they uh also will root a little bit not a ton not like the big breeds and they are very happy to have your garden and um, kitchen scraps and then also we were getting scraps from the local grocery store their fruit and veggie scraps um stuff that they were getting rid of so anyway that's just some of our experiences that we've had and We've loved it. Oh, one thing I'll tell you guys that was amazing, a huge perk that I never expected. We have about 40 huge, large um, blueberry bushes on our property, old growth. They must be six to seven feet tall and in diameter too. They're big. And they had bad poison ivy growing up in the middle of them and would shoot out. And so you'd go to pick. And for people like me that are really reactive to poison ivy, I would have it all over my chest and my neck and my face and my arms. And I remember going to different conferences and asking blueberry experts and asking everybody I could, what can I do about this poison ivy? And they said, mm, it's really, it's really a challenge because you're organic and, and, you can't obviously pour, pour boiling water. You're going to hurt your blueberry plant, all of this. Anyway, I know you and Linda are sheep and goat people, and I accidentally had a goat once. That's kind of a story, but it was a mistake because we have a lot of orchard here, a lot of apple trees and pear trees and the blueberry bushes. So I had had the American guinea hogs hot wired out of the blueberries. But then the goat was eating all the blueberries. So then I decided the pigs were better than the goat. So I hot the pigs in with the blueberries and the goat out. And lo and behold, those wonderful little American guinea hogs ate all that poison ivy and ripped up the roots all the way back into the woods. So that was a huge, wonderful benefit that I think we've got from the rooftops for people that have poison ivy issues. Get yourself some American guinea hogs. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that. I love that. Now, um, I'm asking this to both of you all. Was it difficult for you to sell your meat or package? Can you explain um, how you do that? You want to go first, Linda? We sell our animals direct off the farm. When I have raised some pigs, I have just found an individual who wanted the whole hog or a half hog and we hauled it to the processor and they put in their cutting instructions and paid for the processing and and that's how we've done it i've never um i've never done cuts so okay. never done that gotcha thank same you same for me that's exactly right that's the same for me so i would sell by the whole animal for the half animal if we could find two people meaning i was really still selling by the whole animal mm -hmm. um to keep legal which is critical um yes. i would sell by the whole animal and then as a favor to a friend buyer get the animal hauled to the processor and they would um, pay the processor directly and pay me on the hanging weight um uh i think i'm hearing that recently there's been some laws changed in virginia and they now need to pay by the hoof weight mm -hmm. um my friends at happy rooster farm were just explaining to me but I'd, I'd need to look into that a little bit more um when i was doing this a few years ago 
paying by the hanging weight was legal at that time. And um, and as Linda said, they then provide the processor their cut sheet on how they want things done. I also decided with the American guinea hogs because their whole lives had been on this farm and they had had such happy little lives that I found it to be more um, humane for them to not have to go in a trailer and get all stressed out at the processors. And so I actually uh, talked to the buyers of the pig and offered to them that if they wanted to, they could hire one of the local processors here will come out and shoot them. Hmm. And most everybody did that, uh, mm -hmm. actually everybody because they all felt very comfortable that then the, the pigs never had an unhappy moment. And you'd think the other pigs get all freaked out, but they didn't. They just kind of look over and go, huh, and go back to eating. They, mm -hmm. they seemed to care. At first, I would put up a tarp and try to not let them see, and they just didn't, didn't show any upset whatsoever that one of their litter mates just dropped down in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and way the pigs never had any stress so it worked for us but again this wasn't big huge scale yes yes same here i did the same as linda well both for as letting people come to the farm pick the animal and then take the slaughter um i recently somewhat changed and, and i only changed because again children getting older, family dynamics, things that they wanted to do. And so on last year, 2019, we opened up a cafe. So the idea even for 2020 was, okay, I can do this straight farm truly right into the, the cafe, the restaurant. And so that, but as we're in a crisis, and so I haven't, fruition it having it's just still an idea and i have the recipes because yeah the recipes that i did in 2019 totally i'm bringing those in because i have faithful followers but <laughs> i am going to tweak the recipes uh to add in that but i felt like it because what devonna said on the notion that we're small scale i felt like that would work for me because i could supply myself not necessarily me buying meat from someone else that I hope that they raise them properly. Um, and so that's what we are moving into. So 2020 was going to be our transition year. So it may be 2021 now, uh, but uh, not brick and mortar anymore for the cafe. We stopped that at the end of the year and was moving into a concession trailer. And so that's really what we, uh going to do now that everything is permitted i did all of that because we were really 2020 was going to be the year but everything now is on hold and stuff so that's kind of what we chose um for our meet and and then also i love working with local farmers so because we have definitely older elderly farmers that don't want to beat the bushes like we have and are doing um you know but they can raise quality animals so and so to help them financially if i could buy the animals straight from them not holding money or anything just straight by and then bring that into our faux fours under our label i don't mind doing that because again it's given that that farmer money right off the bat but then i'm able to utilize high quality mm -hmm. animals um and so that no. that's that's what I just I believe in that and I would hope other farmers I'm I'm putting the 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 wink wink out there uh that hopefully other farmers would take that on because if you are that type of farmer that really can understand how to create a business model to incorporate basically a fulfilled supply chain that's what you become then please look to other farmers that may not have that that savviness or that business smart to do that or know how to do it or they may be so rural that they're too far for clients to go to help them out just but please please I always stress do not undercut other farmers please pay them the value 
of that animal. Uh, and, and if you get even into buying produce for them, um, that's just one of the things I want to put out there because we want to be fair to one another. We're all farmers and we're all uh, wanting to do well in our farm businesses. So uh, please, you know, pay what they ask. Um, and some farmers don't know. So help them out with that if they're undercutting themselves. Uh, I see that quite a bit when some of my farmers sell eggs, they're undercutting themselves so much uh, with a dozen of eggs. So um, just want to put that out there. Um, now, one Felicia, of the things, oh, go ahead. I'm Felicia, sorry. Could we, could we chat a little bit about pricing? I would love to hear from yes. and Linda on pricing because I honestly had a really big challenge um, in trying to figure out what pricing I should charge for an organic pasture pig. And yes. so when I was actually talking to somebody at USDA a couple of years ago that deals in um, putting out market prices, and I said, but organic pasture raised pigs aren't on here. How do I know what my metric is? He said, you don't know. We don't know that metric. That's really hard. And so I, I would actually look at what my friends were doing at Happy Rooster Farm, Robin and Greg, what they were charging. I looked at what Joel Salatin is charging. He's up the road from me a few hours. Um, I'd look at what others are charging. However, they were all using a non-GMO feed. And mm -hmm. I was using feed, which was roughly two times the amount. And frankly, I couldn't, I don't wanna say I couldn't make my price point, but I had a hard time making charging as much as I should have charged more than the pasture raised non-GMO fed pigs to cover that, which is why I'm really considering going to the non-GMO feed when I really would like to stick with the organic feed because I believe in, I believe in those values. You know, Devana, you bring up some excellent points there because if you don't know your costs, first of all, you can't price your product. And looking around at others with, you know, similar products or similar kind of products, um, I, I see that that you you saw what so many do find. If you're going to make a premium product, you you have to have a premium price, and the customers who will pay that premium price might be hard to find. I would have. Um, uh, for for anyone watching who is going to raise hogs, we're going to have a hog publication out soon. I don't know how soon, Devana. And it's going to go into the pricing and also the cutout, which is so important to know. And also would like to say, if you're interested in heritage breed hogs, the American Livestock Breed Conservancy has a, a fascinating study that they did comparing like eight different breeds. And they look at finished weight and cut out and, and uh, average daily gain, a lot of things that are important to sort of feed into your profitability. So anyone who would like to have a link to that can email me or, or Devon or Felicia, we can all get you that information. But my email is lindac at ncat.org. And I think doing your homework about what kind of breed you're gonna raise and doing your homework about what things are gonna cost before you invest the time and the money into the hog and then find that um, I've got a product that's gonna be more expensive than most people want to pay. Even though, Devon, I hear what you're saying, it's a quality product. Um, it's sometimes hard to find, uh, unfortunately, it's sometimes hard to find the customer who wants to pay the price that you need. And so sometimes we have to look at just what you were saying. Maybe we can reduce the cost of the feed by still going with a feed we can feel good about, the non-GMO. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Frankly, frankly, I had more interest than I had pigs. Yeah, well, Because good. I did a good job in the marketing on social media, and I okay. knew where to go. I knew All the right. people that were interested, the mamas that are holistic mamas and they want to feed their babies healthy, clean, organic awesome. feed, food and meat. Um, but the challenge in the beginning was really finding that price point that could work and um, 
anyway, yeah, I think it's a challenge. I do. And I'll quickly add in, and then we're going to jump to the chat with questions. Um, I I noticed just selling them live animal, you know, clients coming to the farm. I wasn't getting enough that I needed. That 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 was the first thing I noticed right off the bat. And so I had to like, okay. Then I did the research on the cuts, and so that's what got me into my mentor. Um, He's in Virginia too, Devonna. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think he's in Virginia. And so uh, he just made one statement to me and said, well, you know, what? how do you want to compare this? Well, do you want to make $40 a pound? Or do you want to just, you know, sell this and get X amount, six, $7 a pound? And then it dawned on me what he meant. So where I got the notion of of concession trailer and stuff, that's what he does. So he raised goats and then turn it into goat burgers. And he was like, you get $10 a quarter pound for the burger. And so you're you're getting $40 a pound. And I was like, oh, that's all I needed. And so that's all I heard. That's all I needed. And I'm like, I'm good to go. And so that's kind of where I went because again, that's where the price point based upon how we're raising the animals. So I definitely want to stress to our audience, we're not saying our price point is just based upon us just wanting money. It's not about that. It's that record keeping, knowing what you have put into the animal and not just feed, water, hay, time. Most farmers do not calculate their time. And so when you start calculating everything, most farmers put so much money into their animals and don't have a young person working with you or, you know, a hired employee. Oh my goodness. You know, your money is really going up. So I'm talking about actually looking at the numbers of what you put in to raise that crop of animals that year and dividing it and saying, okay, I need this amount to either break even, because we want to break even, but we do want a little profit, but you will be very surprised the profit is, the margin is not big. Um, and so that's what made me move to, because one, we're raising high quality animals, and I say high quality heritage breed, especially during the crisis that we're going through. We want animals that know how to survive in anything. What if we're not able to get feed? These animals just, let them go. They know how to survive. You know, so it's, it's that that I wanted to share with people because it's the animal. It really is the animal. If you have an animal that's so programmed on having to eat feed, and, and I have seen this going up that they stand there and don't know that they could just lean down and eat grass. They literally starve themselves to death because they was just conditioned to eat feed from birth. And if you don't have an animal that could go back and forth when you need them to be, you end up really hurting yourself. But if we're in a crisis and we trucks not coming in and we cannot get what we need from the co-op, open the gate. Open the gate. The animals will be OK. You still have meat for your family. That's, that's how I look at it. So, all right, ladies, we're going to move to questions. How many weeks does it take to get chickens up to market weight free range? Um, and this is done from Donna Coffin from University of Maine Extension. Um, Donna, great question. That would depend on uh, how much there is for them to eat, but also on the breed. And I, I don't think you'll touch what you can do with a chicken tractor and a more conventional breed with, with the heritage breeds. What's, what's your thought, Devonna? It's so sad. So I have not raised the Cornish crosses, um, but a girlfriend of mine, another girlfriend of mine down the road, the other way they have, they raise them and they're kind of sad birds to raise. They get so fat that they fall on their breasts. They can't even hardly move around. Um, but she said there's nothing like them and they grow out quick. I haven't raised them myself, so I don't want to mislead you but I swear it's something like eight to 10 weeks. It's something crazy, eight to 10 to 12 weeks. It's crazy fast. 
and she has losses the a percentage of them die because they're just they've got this genetic dysfunction that gives them such a large breast but in the freezer that's a nice meaty bird that americans really love now i personally don't think that it has the flavor of um so i've raised narragansett turkeys and i've raised uh icelandic icelandic chickens are not good chickens for a meat bird are so scrawny don't don't they're great for so many other things but they are not good meat birds you get nothing um but anyway they they have a better flavor to me they have a more intense flavor profile and i think they take longer to grow up to market with. we've got a natural publication on our poultry page that deals with the comparison of heritage breeds to conventional breeds and it looks at the time that it takes, but I don't think it's looking at free range necessarily. I think they were all being fed a uh, similar diet. So I don't know that I can actually answer answer on that. Um, and I um, think that I think it would be very hard to have a only free ranged uh, bird and not have it have some offering. You you have to have a whole lot going on there. They're, they're birds are domestic, or sorry, excuse me, chickens are domesticated animals. And so I really do think you'd have to have uh, some feed happening. So, so my chickens, when I, I had some free range chickens as well, they were hens, they would clean up after the sheep, like in the springtime when we were feeding some extra, and then bugs and grass. And I think they would do quite well. I wasn't feeding the, the hens at that point either because they were doing just fine. Um, I just couldn't keep them out of my garden and they were very destructive in mine. They didn't eat the pest, they ate the tomatoes. So I don't have experience with uh, free range broilers. I've never, I don't know anyone who is doing that. They, everyone I know that is doing broilers is providing a, a complete feed. So. Mm -hmm. And right. the only thing I was going to share is going to take longer. It, it's well, going to be your management style. Um, and, and as you can hear, I was raised on, free range. So mm -hmm. we we had we did do free range broilers when I was younger. I, I have never done broilers because I do he, just, you know, laying hens. Uh, but we have had uh, the free range broilers and um, it just takes longer. And 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 that same even with small ruminants. It's going to be your management style, what you choose. How fast do you need to get your your rate of return basically mm -hmm. and so that that really is how it goes so it really depends upon your management um and definitely the the investment that you have put into your farm on on which way you're going to go yeah so it definitely i will tell yep. you free range is going to take longer with any breed of animal so freedom rangers are a great um heritage bird that does really well cleaning up gardens and on pasture and if you are feeding them feed, then typically it takes four to five months to grow out to market weight, while the Cornish crosses take between eight to 10 weeks. So it looks like about double. Um, that's if you're feeding them. But if they're not getting fed, just like I said with pigs, when I mentioned the pigs in the woods, that I don't have enough nuts and forage in my woods, I had to feed and almost everybody i've ever talked to has to feed the pigs so so yeah like linda said if you've got enough going on maybe you could do it that fast but we think it'll take a little longer and i wanted to chime in one of our partners is having a virtual farm tour it's asan alabama um, sustainable agriculture network um, please, please go on their Facebook page. Um, they are having, and it's all on poultry. So it's a, a poultry farm that they're going to, that will be talking about a lot of what we have discussed today. So please, please um, check that out. Next question is on free range and sheep, what issues are of concern with forage availability in the winter months in South Mississippi? And is it necessary to utilize hay and feed or can plantings of winter forage work? So Ms. Terry, I have done that. I have actually planted 
Um, I work with some powerhouse uh, uh, when it comes to that management intensive grazing. And one of them really just told me, stop planting. <laughs> because, And the reason why he said that was because when the animals are there, of, of course, the manure is dropping and you have dormant seeds. And so he was like, if you want to continue to pay for seeds and do that, you can, but leave the animals there and then those dormant seeds will come up. And so I have planted for the winter and, and not just rye. I really kind of got the reason why I started a grass fed and, and I was raised that way. So I understood just grass fed but we were doing open continuous grazing so then i had to learn how to do the paddock way and so i did plant it was successful i liked what i got off of it it bought the nutritional value of the animals up um mm -hmm. which i was very grateful for and it was good so it really depends on if you one have the finances to buy the seeds um, I cannot think off the top of my head, but I found a very, very good seed company that breaks the seeds down for you. And what I mean by that is if you only need 10 pounds of seeds, they're not going to sell you 50 pounds. They're only going to send you, you know, sell you 10 pounds. So it's very few companies that will do that and let you create your own mix as well. Um, but I definitely, please, please, um, I'll put my email address in the chat. Please touch bases with me because I, I just right off the top of my head, I cannot remember to see company. Um, hey, uh, definitely have done that um, and, and continue. So I wanted to give that disclaimer. I'm never, ever going to put my animals in danger. And so if I have to bring in feed and I'm going to do what I have done, what Devon have done, that non-GMO, um, the organic is just too expensive. I, I've done it with some of our animals, but well, I do organic feed with the chicks. When I bring the chicks in, I'm doing organic. Um, but I just, it's very, it's too expensive for the sheep. So I do non-GMO, um, but I'm going to take care of the animals if, if, if I can. One of the things I've noticed in Mississippi that we can of course grow year round if i'm working with producers and and um these uh, gurus that talk about management intensive grazing grazing management and they're in states that have snow on the ground but their animals are still eating then i know that mississippi can do this um it's a learning curve like linda and devon and i've said it's educating yourself on the management and how you can do it. So um, Linda and Devon, do you want to chime in on that question? I, I, would, I would say I agree with what you said, Felicia. Uh, the answer is going to depend on how many animals you have on how much productive land. So, so if you have stocked your farm so that you have uh, an ample amount of acres, in my environment, you could graze year round we always have to feed some hay. And we plant, like you, some rye, but also turnips and some crimson clover. We put some things out in part because my husband just likes to. And it does give a nutritional boost. And we are we are gonna be lambing at the end of winter. So our ewes probably need that extra nutrition and it makes us feel good to have it. We also stockpile fescue in my environment in Arkansas, which helps extend our grazing. People have told me, and I believe it, in Minnesota and in Arkansas and in Mississippi, most people feed hay about 90 days. Mm -hmm. That's too much. We shouldn't yeah. need to feed hay that many days in any of those places. Um, so our goal is to feed hay no more than 60 days um, and then try to get the best kind of hay and realize that you're adding nutrients onto your land every time you feed a bale of hay. You also, by the way, are adding some weed seeds. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've seen cockleburr on my farm this year for the first time because we fed hay that had cockleburr seeds in it. So it's it's definitely a, a mixed blessing, but um, I don't feel badly about feeding some hay. Like you said, we got to take care of the animals. They have the ruminants. They have to have enough forage. But as much as we can keep them grazing standing forage. A, they like it better, it's better for them, and it's cheaper. So, did that? Yeah, and this is not in regards to sheep because I have never done sheep, 
but just in terms of reseeding my pastures, I always had to do every time I would have the pigs on one, even though they had lots of woods, they would tear up the pasture. So we'd pop them to another and we rotate them through. And uh, I would reseed very similarly to what Linda said with daikon uh, radish to break up the soil because we'd really get some compaction with the pigs. Uh, with the clover, the crimson clover, loved it to fix the nitrogen. And then we'd also do a barley or something because next time they're coming around, they like to eat it. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, but that, um, and I had to do it every time coming behind the pigs because they're hard on the pasture. They're much better in the woods, especially for cleaning up the brambles. Oh, it's great. So let me add, and this is one of our questions, um, and we get this a lot from our client. How do you feel about livestock being raised sustainably? Does it create a problem with their manure? Because we hear that sometimes with uh, other ways of, of managing animals. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, my thought is it depends on the carrying capacity. So it depends on the size of your farm and the carrying capacity. To my mind, the manure is wonderful and I love it. It's great. It fertilizes my land. It's not running off into the waterways because I don't have too much, too many animals on too little land. So my carrying capacity, it, it, it equals out. It's yeah. able to be absorbed and used as a fertilizer. And when you have a confined animal situation, you have an enormous amount of manure that isn't able to be used, utilized sustainably, and maybe hopefully could be taken out of that situation and used on other farms elsewhere. Yeah, I, I agree with what Devana just said. I, I would add that even if your stocking rate is right for your farm, your management can um, throw things out of whack. And, and uh, Talisha, I talked about that last week, like with our sheep and our goats, if you have water available on every pasture, that's a huge help. If you can move a portable water tank and provide it on that pasture, it's a huge help. If you can't and you have them coming back to a, like a central location for water all the time, what will happen is you're gonna get too much manure in that area and not enough out there at the far reaches of the farm. And so it's it's important to, like Devana said, have your stocking rate right, right, and then you have to manage it thoughtfully so that they are leaving the manure where you need it on the pasture and not bringing it back to a central area. Does Such that make a sense? Great point. So I, then, I think so it's a huge resource. It's wonderful for for building up our our um, soil organic matter and helping our our farm be more fertile. And we need to track this with. Um, soil tests and then and then another thing we can do is because we are feeding hay we can pick out the the field that needs more fertility and feed our hay there in the winter and that way we're depositing more manure in that location and again keeping the water out there too so that they don't have a reason why they're going to move all the nutrients back to a central a central location with sheep and goats this is important from a parasite control issue as well and for evening out the grazing because in the old days before we got our water where we needed it they would overgraze near the water and you can just see how this would happen and and overgraze near the water as you got further out it was undergrazed and under fertilized and un underutilized so so by your management you can do a lot to um, so linda you. what would you do then in that case would you have to use some spreader uh, function, whether I've seen folks use a piece of chain length fence behind the tractor and pull it along and spread it, what what do you do? Well, we just got a lot more intentional about closing off that area and putting the water out further back. We also clean out the barn and compost that and yes, get that spread out on the on the fields, on the far back fields, but really getting the water in place was key to mm -hmm. solving that that issue. So thank you so much. And we're getting close to closing, but I want to add this last question. 
it would be nice to hear your opinion about grass-fed meat benefits to our health. Uh, I can name one and you continue, Devana. I believe that grass-fed meat is better for our health, especially if they're eating a diverse diet. And I think um, research has shown this. The, the ratio, the omega-3s and the omega-6 and, and the vitamin E content and the, the iron and the protein, it's definitely a benefit to our health to raise grass-fed meat. It's a benefit to the environment, in my opinion. I like the yes. thought of all those acres being covered with perennial pastures in most cases, uh, stopping soil erosion, building soil organic matter, improving our, our uh, water absorption across the farms. I just really believe that grass-fed meat is good for us and for the environment. Okay, Devana. So much research done on this and everything that Linda said. We are happy to provide links to folks um, and give more information, but there's a ton of research. It's great for our health. It's great for the animal's health. It's great for the environment. It's really wonderful all around. And Food Animal Concerns Trust has a pretty cool service that they will do for you. They've got a whole flight of um, resources for cons for consumers so a farmer can hand this out to their customer see that talks about the the health benefits of pastured pork of pastured chickens of grass-fed beef and so on and they will actually insert your own photo from your farm so I think that's a really cool service that they do so that you can have a customized kind of flyer it's ready to go the research is on there, um, all the bullet points. It's very nicely designed. And you can send them a photo from your farm and they will send you back the PDFs. So you can get it printed in color and pass it out at the farmer's market or to your customers, whatever. So I think that's really cool. And again, uh, as Devana said, y'all can email us and we'll we'll get you that information. Yeah, Linda, do you mind that is dropping it into the chat too? Can, do you remember? Uh, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. Are you saying, will I get it done? Let me try. <laughs> so they are FACT, the Food Animals Trust Organization. They are a wonderful non information. So glad Linda brought that up. Felicia, before you close this out, you had said something that really caught my interest. So on our farm here, as new and beginning farmers, we made a lot of mistakes. And one of them was, I had a wonderful Amish farmer, Mennonite farmer up in Pennsylvania who is um, farming really regeneratively, tell me that with three does and one buck rabbit, three, ra three females and one male rabbit, you can have as much meat as a beef, an entire beef for the year. I'm in. So we decided to do rabbits. And personally, what a huge mistake. They're cute. They're fuzzy. They scream when you try to slaughter them. And it's just a disaster. They, I built, well, we built this huge rabbit duplex where we drag it around the pasture. And they're very clever little buggers. They dig right out. So we then had bunny rabbits everywhere everywhere and then digging into my garden. So you mentioned that you free range your rabbits and I can't even get my brain around it. I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I said that's, that's the goal because we have done the cage rabbits. So I've done cage and you know, with the rabbit hutches and then we created the rabbit tractor. So same as the chicken tractor would, but moving them around and putting the slats at the bottom. And so, but again, it was so much, it's labor intensive when you have the tractors of any animal. And when you're, you have them caged up like that, it's labor intensive on the farmer. And so I was like, okay, how can we get more? Because again, how I was raised is letting the animal be as free and doing its thing as possible. And, and again, now, this is not always commercial. So please, I want to let make sure our audience understand that. Um, 
that, you know, when you do commercial, you have to do what you have to do because you're raising many, many animals. But when it's on a smaller scale and you're homesteading, you're feeding yourself and maybe, you know, three, four or five families, you, you could do basically whatever you choose to do. So no, Devon, I was thinking about doing that because, and now, and again, you and I, and hopefully we could come back and share this with people in the future. I'm thinking about the woods, being able to let them do them, but of course, fencing them in, but it's making the area and, and we would put things by the fence. So digging down and putting the, the wire where they can't dig out, of that fenced in area, but doing a large enough space that they feel like, oh, I'm free because they, they're in their environment. So we'll I love it. You better write up a publication on that and let us know how that all works because they are smart little boogers and determined. They will dig their way out. And we didn't have the slots on the bottom. We still have this beautiful duplex rabbit land that was so hard to move so heavy and so hard yes. to move our rabbit tractor we would drag it around so they'd have fresh new pasture but they would within a day dig themselves out yes. and i thought this is impossible yes and then see i bet you money if you go back to the amish gentleman they free range i bet you money because it's, it's again is we're talking about traditional methodologies and, and, and more modern slash commercial methodologies. And that's why I try to make sure that- I do not think they do. You don't? I think they keep them in cages. No, because they do a big, huge deal with their um, with their cattle and their yes. dairy and their vegetables. So there's no way they could have rabbits digging holes everywhere all over. Gotcha. So, but wow. I could so be wrong. they're harvesting quite vegetables. often then. That that's where that's going. They're quite, they're harvesting quite often. Then it would be nice to be able to even get him on an interview because it's because is more farmers want to learn this and also thinking about new people, people that have never farmed that want to get into livestock, but they one they'll have the land for small ruminants, but they can do few chickens. They could do a rabbit and rabbits. And so it would be nice if, if, if you know, if you could find, find out more information from him or we can invite him, um, because that would be phenomenal to find out how he's doing it to get that much meat, to say that you're getting, you know, equivalent to, yeah, beef cattle, that's, that's a lot of meat. You're on meat, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, and with the person that asked about health benefits, um, rabbit is incredibly healthy because they are grazers. And, you know, as long as they're on healthy pastures, they have great manure, great waste for the garden that doesn't burn and can be used right away. So there's lots of benefits, but we, and, and we love the way they taste in our house. We couldn't quite get past the cute factor and the screaming when you slaughter them. That's pretty horrible. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And I, yeah, I was raised with all and, and basically I I raised what I was raised up on. Uh, so the animals, I'm so used to all of these animals and, and yeah, it, it is that. And and so but I definitely wanted to just make sure we added in small animals because some of our farmers can only do small animals. They couldn't move up to the small room. And so I thank you ladies for sharing your experience with those animals and, and how it could be a benefit to any person, uh, experienced farmer, even a new and beginning farmer. So we want to close out today. We have come to our hour. And again, this is the weekly Wednesday workshop. And we were joined today by Linda Coffey and Devonna Bell. And I'm so grateful to you ladies for joining me today and sharing your experiences of your farm and how you manage your farm, because that's the key. We can buy and grow and do all of this stuff, but it boils down to our management style. And here at NCAP, we're not wanting to tell you how to manage. We want to share the various ways of management, and then you choose what's the best 
uh, methodology for your land, your stock and density and rate, all of those things take into consideration is what makes a successful farm. If you're small or large, it is truly your management style. And our office and all of our office always, always push record keeping please make sure you keep records because you won't know what you're doing from year to year um and it can be as grander or as micro as you want it just at the end of the day make sure you're keeping records of your sales when you buy and we're talking about even fee fee costs go up and so if you have a record of that each year or each every six to eight months especially in the crisis that we're in, the prices are uh, fluctuating right now. And so record keeping is key. And so that is a key portion of your farm management as well. And please don't leave that out. So we'll close out today. Thank you so much for thank all you. of our clients. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. And we want to thank so everybody that joined us. Thanks for the great work. Yes, yes, yes. And again, we put our email address in the chat uh, for our callers. I will say it briefly. It is Devana B at NCAT.org, D E B as in Victor, O N A B as in Boy at NCAT.org, and Linda C at NCAT.org, and Felicia B, F E L I C I A, B is in boy at NCAT.org. And we thank you so much for joining us today. And please join us next week again for our weekly Wednesday workshop at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. And thank all you listeners. Thank please you. let us know if you have more questions. We'll be happy to, to talk some more. Thanks, Felicia. Thanks, Devana.